Cool. Yeah, yeah we better get started. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, if if you came along to XC24, you probably um, uh, heard Alex talking a bit about some of the um, performance challenges that the artist project has presented. Um, and it's kind of been an, an ideal place to look at some of the most optimal ways to do some quite complex and in-depth calculations. Uh, and so uh, I thought it's, I think it's probably a, the only project that we've got at the moment that's kind of using Rust really, you know, in in earnest in, uh, and is, has some great use cases. And uh, I think Rishi's going to give us a bit of a tour of where how this got started and 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 the language. And I think we might have another session. So an, another thing that's been going on at Artists is that some of this work is also being used in the browser. So um, I think we're going to have another session to talk about WASM and related tech and how that's how the Rust work is also impacting the front end. Uh, so yeah, go go for it, Rishi. Yeah, all right, thank you. Uh... Yeah, as Joe mentioned, uh, this is essentially a like I just talked through my it's like an experience report and what it feels like to write Rust code for like coming from a C engine perspective. And yeah, we'll just we'll we'll go through we'll go through my personal experience. Uh, we'll highlight and highlight the rewarding parts, the challenging parts for me, and what's maybe what's similar, what's very different. So yeah, this is, this is an experience report to personal, personal opinions, which is essentially programmer way of saying, don't quote me on this, but yeah, let's, let's go for it. So just to set up the context, I think uh, this kind of like a fun graph that you see uh, what it like what it's like to learn a new language or learn any new skill i guess uh, so i i think i'm somewhere around here but sometimes i think i'm probably closer to this this plot in the curve i i have no idea but i keep doing it and kind of just kind of like the compiler just yells at me and then i it's the series of fixing compiler errors till I get till I get to the right spot. Yeah. So let's let's first look at the let's first look at the rewarding bits that I found with using Rust for the last five months. So the dev experience, the type system, uh, all of these things. So we'll go through them one by one. So in terms of dev experience, I think uh, since I am an Emacs user. Uh, the Rust mode, Rust analyzer, and light check Rust combination works really well for me. Uh, I can I can keep my Emacs open. I can uh, I can quickly look at errors that uh, light check throws before even I before I even need to compile, and I get all of these type inferences uh, shown to me, which also are very helpful if like. Especially if you're coming from closure and dealing with a type based language for the first time. So these kinds of things really help. Uh, I, th I think VS Code also has uh, the Rust analyzer package, which kind of does a lot of these things. Plus VS Code has debugging support, which is much easier to set up than uh, I, I haven't been able to set up debugging support in Emacs. So if somebody is interested, uh, I would definitely be willing to help. All right, so the first thing kind, like the first thing that kind of strikes you when you will start with Rust is of course the type system, right? So Rust has a very strict type system. Uh, every function parameter has to have an explicit type types do not automatically cast into other types. So it's like a strongly type, statically type language. Uh, types can be inferred 
you don't need to specify the type for everything. Like uh, if I if I get rid of the bool here, it would still work because it would infer the type to be a boolean. <laughs> you also have like tuple types, arrays, slices. You have structs and enums, which are user defined types. There are trait types, which is kind of similar to uh, what interfaces are in other languages. And uh, I think the highlight of the REST type system, I would definitely say, is like the enum. Uh, it's it's a sum type and it has associated data with it. So as you can see here, there's a JSON value enum, and it can either be a string or it can be an int and it can be a double. And then it can hold uh, data of any associated type, right? So combined with that, uh, combined with powerful pattern matching support, I think enums become much more useful in Rust. They enable very elegant error handling uh, with option and result types. So option and results are also at their like. Basically, they are just incomes with associated data, right? And they are also very helpful to model type safe heterogeneous collections, right? Which we can probably see here. So the, by default, Rust collections are all type, right? But what if you really, really want to have a collection of heterogeneous data? you better make sure that they are all still logically, uh, they still logically make sense to be in a collection, right? This is not a cop out for bad data design, but you can imagine a hash map of, an, of a JSON object, right? Uh, which where you want heterogeneity in the values that you get. So this is, this is generally what Rust uh, devs will tend to use. Right. All right. Uh, there's also something called a type state pattern, which uh, which is enabled by using enums. So essentially, what you do is you define you define states for a possible struct, like a user struct, for example, and you define the states that the user struct can be in in your uh, in your code. Right, and then the struct is a generic over over the over the possible states, and then in the implementation you can kind of say implement these functions just for this state, right? So, for example, if you have a user and you say these are my roles, right, and then you say user is a generic over the role, and then you save the state in some something called a phantom data this essentially doesn't take up any memory apparently but this is how you do it and then if you wanted to have functions which are common to all users you would just put them in this impulse block which is kind of where you define methods for a struct and then the interesting bit is you can do stuff like this where you can say implement these functions only if the user is a viewer Right, and then you implement a completely separate set of functions to say if the user is an editor, right? And what you get when you actually set this up is like compiler level support to say if it's a user object, you will not get any of the functions in the editor, right? They are just not allowed. Your code will not compile. So what then you do is you create a new user, let's say, using this mechanism, which says the state is, this is the default state role, right? So you create a viewer, and then you say, okay, viewer.promote. Essentially, you, you implement whatever logic you need to actually promote a viewer to an editor, right? And then once that happens, uh, you can then have access to functions in the editor state. Right, uh, editor type. So this kind, I I found this to be kind of very cool implementation of generics and enums in Rust. Then uh, the next 
interesting bit that I found was pattern matching. I think uh, having done a bit of work in Elixir, uh, this this kind of wasn't wasn't unexpected, but it was a welcome welcome change uh, from Clojure. I, I I guess call dot match is probably something that people would use if they wanted to, but just having language level support was was great. Uh, you could do individual matches. You could do like you could do nested matches because since this is an option type, you could say if the option is 50 or whatever, or you could match it to a local variable, or you could have a catch all with an underscore to say this is the default case. You can also have uh, like either or, like you can say match one or two, or you can even have a range. Like so, if if the data type of X is something that can be ranged over, uh, then I think which are the numerical types, and I think there is the char uh, characters can also be in a range. So if if your data type is that, you can probably use ranges also. Right. Of course, you have the the pattern matching. You can also power destructuring, similar to what Clojure has, right? So you could do match point with x and if y is zero, right? So get the value of x if y matches. I, I think uh, this kind of self-explanatory. You can do deeply nested matches also. So this is a message enum which has a change color value, which probably contains a color enum which has an HSV value, and you can nest how much ever you want. Right? So this. Yeah, I think this kind of helps to write uh, uh, like helps to write very elegant code, I guess. And more importantly, the match is an expression. So you can like as long as all the arms of the match return return the same type, uh, you can actually return values from the match. Right. Uh, the next thing that kind of strikes me when uh, I compare closure and Rust would be, of course, mutability. So Rust follows in the same footsteps of having data immutable by default, just like closure. You can explicitly say that I want the data to be mutable, in which case uh, you will, of course, be able to change the data as you can see here. <laughs> As you can imagine, function uh, parameters here, if, if they need to be mutable, you have to define them to be mutable. Otherwise, you will not be able to change data. Right? Uh, so you would think having this kind of having, especially having this kind of mutability in a language would make it unsafe from a uh, like from a concurrency point of view, or make make it somehow thread unsafe. But uh, I think the borrow checker mechanism in Rust is more than capable of uh, helping you avoid shooting yourself in the foot by using too many mutations uh, spread across everywhere. Right. So uh, yeah, I guess uh, we'll we'll. I'll probably be able to better explain it when we actually talk about the borrow checker. Uh, another, another thing that I really liked about uh, Rust was the way in which error handling is done. Right, so uh, Rust requires you to acknowledge the possibility of an error very explicitly, right, and take action to handle the error even before your code can compile. So this requires, like this makes the program more robust, of course, because you will discover and handle errors at the time of writing code rather than at the time of production, right? So this requirement is mainly enforced through two types. One is the option type, uh, which says, uh, it is a way to say whether a value is present or 
can it be absent, right? And the other is the result enum, which says you can either have a value or you can have an error, right? So for example, if you had something like this, where you read from a socket and you give it a WebSocket config and you get a result, right? So the result, there could be, there will be two possibilities. You could either get a message or you could get a socket error, right? So when you're writing such code, you will be forced to handle that, right? Uh, when you get a message here, the type of the message is such, right, it is the result type. So you can't directly use the message value anywhere else, right? You have to match against it or unwrap it, which is kind of considered bad practice, but you can unwrap and use defaults. For example, here, uh, keep alive is an optional bool. Right. So then I said, okay, if, if keep alive is there, then unwrap it for me, or then just say true, right? Because that's my default value. And here, for example, then you have to actually do uh, some kind of error handling because the type system tells you that this is a result. So it could have an error, right? Now, some of you may have noticed there is also the question mark operator. Uh, this is also very helpful. Uh, which you can use to streamline error processing even better. So basically what it does is if the value on which you apply the operator is an error type or a null type in case of uh, options, you will get an early exit from the function with the appropriate error type. Like here there is a catch to say the connect has to return an error which is same as socket error, but then there are other ways of uh, mapping the error from one to another. Like you can say dot map error, and then if the connect method is returning the connection error, then you can do a map error and then change, like use anything you want from the connection and create a socket error, right? There is some ceremony around it, but early exits like this are uh, a very good way to do and trust. And yeah, I I definitely thought it was a welcome welcome thing feature to the language. Right? So it just give me yeah okay cool. Uh, the next thing we would talk about would be the kind of the elephant in the room, which is the Rust borrow checker. Uh, the Rust borrow checker is a phase in the Rust compiler, which uh, which enforces certain rules as to how data can be owned and passed around between functions. So essentially, what it does is it enforces ownership rules to say each value in Rust has an owner. So here, for example, if I create P1 equal to point, P1 is the owner of the value, right? It is the owner of the memory location that is allocated for this truck. This will probably be on the stack because the size is known. But if if it's something like, uh, I don't know, a box which is allocated on the heap or a VEC which is also allocated on the heap, uh, it, this P1 is the owner of that memory, right? Now, when you say P2 equal to P1, P2 has now become the owner of that memory, right? It has become the owner of that value. It is no longer valid to use P1 anywhere else because P1 has nothing, right? P2 is now the owner through which you have to access whatever you want to do. So this is kind of one uh, one aspect of the borrow checker, but as you can imagine, this will get tedious very quickly, and uh, this definitely doesn't cover all the use cases that programmers would typically need, right? So, sorry, hold on. Yeah. So then, uh, if we what happens if we just want to read a value, right? So for example, in the print fun print point function. I don't want to own the value. There's no there's no use for owning the value in this function. So 
what Rust allows is it allows the borrow, of course. So you can say, yeah. So here, for example, you can say, okay, instead of instead of the point structure, don't don't give me ownership of the point structure. Just give me a give me a reference, and by default, this reference is an immutable reference. So I can read from it, but I will never be able to mutate anything, right? And then what you can do is you can say, okay, P1 is mutable, but you can still print whatever is in P1. P1, even after this function is called, P1 is still the owner, right? Nothing is, uh, nothing, ownership hasn't changed, right? So I can just do P1.x equal to 42, right? And you can have, so underlying rule here is, you can have as many immutable borrows or references to a to a, to an owned value as you want, right? So as you can see here, S1 and S2 are both like immute S1 and immute S2 are both immutable references to S1. But yeah. okay, the other thing that I didn't explain is like immutable reference, you can also have an immute. Uh, Similar to immutable reference, you can also have a mutable reference, right? So mute S1 is a mutable reference into S1. And I can actually use mute S1 to change or call methods on S1, which need mutability, right? But what the borrow checker says is you can have as many immutable references as you want. You can have one mutable reference if you want. You can't have both at the same time, right? So the point at which the immutable references stop being used, a mutable reference can be created, right? Uh, so for example, if I would have If I would have commented out this line, right, this mutable reference would be possible because the immutable references stop being used after this point. So it's fine for you to have a mutable reference at this point. But because there is a line which is still accessing the immutable reference, this is no longer valid, right? So it is definitely a uh, a learning curve to deal with the borrow checker. But I think once you wrap your head around it, it like it gives you a lot of confidence in the code that you write, especially code which involves a lot of uh, multi-threaded access, right? So uh, yeah, I I kind of have started to like tended to think of it like compile time read write locking. So this is this like if you were writing a read write log, this is what you would do, right? You would have as many readers as you want, but only one writer. Right. All right. So then it's not like compared to closure, it's not all all roses, right? Uh, there are I there have been bits which I found to be challenging. And we'll just quickly go through some of them. So, uh, yeah, so another, a very common use case for uh, backend developers of, and developers of any like any solution have is you need, you sometimes need to have shared state, right? And that shared state tends to be accessed by multiple threads because it has some context about what what is being done, right? So, in closure, you would typically handle this with like a, an atom which is defined at the namespace level, right? And then you would swap in and out of the atom. If if you don't want database shared state, right? That is a completely different beast. Uh, but if you want like a local shared state to the service, uh, I found the Rust way slightly complicated. Uh, it's like once you get used to it, it's probably fine. But 
essentially what you have to do is you have to use uh, types like ARC and RC, not RC, ARC, which are essentially reference counted uh, variables. So uh, it essentially keeps a track of how many times clone has been called on that on that value. And once the the count or the reference count goes to zero, it says, OK, this value can now be dropped, right? And this is, this is done at runtime. Uh, this is not a compile time thing, but uh, like it's a, a runtime construct, right? So the RCARC structs basically keep track of references, and which means it, it, they're always aware of the number of owners of that value, right? Uh, so whenever you do clone, it increases the value. Whenever, whenever the clone value, for the example, this P clone, whenever this uh, exits, this thread exists, uh, you drop the clone, which means you decrease the reference count, right? And cloning will never perform a deep copy. It's like it's like pointers to the same memory essentially. And yeah, I think uh, the, the way that you would do it is then you need to have a, like, it's all good to have shared access to some data or some variable, but Rust enforces that ARC by themselves cannot have a mutable reference. So if you wrap something with just an ARC, you will never be able to mutate it. Right, you can only deref it, meaning you can only read it. But uh, if you want to mutate it, then you have to use something like a mutex inside of the ARC. Then what you do is essentially you clone the ARC, which clones will probably will not clone the mutex, but essentially it allows you to lock the value that is inside the mutex and then you can do something like this, which is p.log.unwrap. And here, what it means is once this statement executes, if if there are multiple threads, of course, this will wait for a log because this is a new text. If multiple threads are contending for it, and then whoever is able to proceed beyond the lock or acquire the lock, you can you can mutate that value. And once this uh, p variable goes out of scope your lock is automatically dropped so doable but uh, yeah it kind of, it kind of doesn't have the same ergonomics that uh, an atom swap has for example in closure i think one of the key joys of writing closure code is its support for structurally shared immutable collections, right? And the rich API that is provided on top of these collections. Rust also has collections, all the typical collections that you would need. It also has uh, like iterator functions like this, which uh, you can use to map, filter, fold, etc. All of those, uh, all of those are available, but as we have seen before, collections are type. Uh, they are homogeneous. So at the time of designing your data structure, you really have to think about what type of data is going to go into your collection. Right? And another, sorry, another key difference is uh, collections are in place mutations, so they are not structurally shared or uh, they are not persistent data structures or anything like that, right? Uh, that means that you have to take into account the same kind of borrow checker rules that you would do for any other variable, right? So that you ensure that you only have one mutable reference to the collection and you are not changing the collection as you're reading from it and stuff like that. Uh, 
<clears throat> another, and I, I, this is something I still struggle with. Another uh, surprising challenge for me was uh, functions and closures in Rust are not as simple as they appear to be. Uh, there are essentially two types. One is the F, like small fn type, which is just a function pointer. So anything you define with fn becomes an fn type in the compiled uh, in the compiled binary, right? And there's no capture, right? Uh, so there's no capturing of the context in which the function is defined. And the other is closures, which are essentially a set of traits. So a trait meaning an interface. So it has three traits. Uh, so it, will, it can be a fn, it can be an fn mute, or it can be an fn once. And closures are your typical anonymous functions, and they can wrap over the local context in which they are defined, right? So for example, if you look at this, this is a closure. You assign it to a variable. At this point, the parameter types are unknown, and that is why the return types are also unknown. That's fine. But the first time you use it, right, uh, the type of printer becomes something that implements fn, takes two integers, and returns an integer. So now, if you try to do printer 1.0, 2.0, it won't compile because printer has already become a function which takes two integers. So you can't give it to floating point numbers, right? Then, as you can imagine, if you are capturing the environment in a Rust context, you are also having to deal with the borrow checker because the environment is completely controlled by the borrow checker, right? So, for example, if you have a multiplier here and you define a closure which captures multiplier, the Rust compiler here uh, interprets it to say, okay, you're not actually changing multiplier anywhere here. So an immutable borrow is fine, right? So this, so closure, which captures its environment in an immutable borrow form is known as an FN closure. And an FN closure is safe to be called as many times as you want because you're not mutating anything. You could have side effects, but those are not considered. Uh, the variables that you are capturing, you can't change them because you, you don't have a mutable uh, reference to it. So they are known as FNs and they can be called multiple times. If instead you have a closure like this, which is actually capturing the capturing a mutable variable here, right? And once that happens, this becomes an FN mute instead of an FN. And an FN mute has to be able to borrow the value mutably. Once it borrows the value mutably, you can't really use it anywhere else. So if I have rebase as like a read-only reference to base, I can't use it here because now the increment has the incrementer has mutably borrowed the base variable, right? And the last one is something called fn once, which is a, a variation where you are you are consuming the value in the environment in which you are defined, right? So if if this is your definition and you say let owned x be x, here what you're doing is you're moving x into owned x, right? And so you print and consume can never be called two times because there are no two values or two copies of x to consume, right? So print and consume can only ever be called once. So it is known as an fn once uh, closure, right? Again, if, if I explained it to you like this, 
kind of seems uh, straightforward, but when you start combining it with traits and lifetimes and multi-threaded code, where you have to pass around variables across thread boundaries, this tends to become quite complicated quite quickly. So for example, something like this, right? Uh, which is a subscribe function. And all it actually needs is some way of processing the GraphQL data that it, uh, it got from the web, web socket and send it along to something else, right? But as you can see here, uh, it takes the process GraphQL function as a generic, and the generic is implementing an FN because it can be called multiple times for every message. And then it has to implement a send, then it has to be a static. Uh, it, like, it tends to get very messy very quickly. And this is the actual uh, closure that we actually wanted to pass, which is uh, in the process variable, right? It's just a simple, it's just a simple closure. Right? So yeah, I, I think uh, I definitely find functions and closures, especially to be quite challenging still. <laughs> Having said that, uh, the Rust standard library tends to implement uh, closures very heavily. So, yeah, I guess I guess there are people who can still work with it. Uh, next is concurrency. I think Rust provides very good mechanisms for writing thread-safe concurrent code. Like the borrow checker rules still apply when you're uh, moving data across threads, right? So, but it also tends to make it harder for you to wrap your head around how to write concurrent code well, right? The spawn function, for example, uh, that you see here, it expects a closure that you, like this closure, whatever you pass in, it need, needs to have something called a static lifetime, which means it has to be valid as long as the program is executing, which kind of makes sense, right? You don't know when the thread will actually execute the closure that you're passing. So it has to be valid throughout the program execution, right? And whatever data you pass into the closure or whatever data is getting captured by the closure also needs to have a trait called send. So a send is a trait that is implemented, automatically implemented for most of the basic types and also for types that combine the basic types. So if you have a struct of types that are all send, you have a st send struct. And you can only pass around data to other threads if it is a send kind of uh, struct. So for example, the RC uh, type in the standard library is not send because it is not considered to be uh, thread save since the reference counting implementation is not atomic. So if you have like an RC which wraps something, you probably will not be able to send it across thread boundaries. Right. Uh, the other way is of course you so for example, let's look at what is happening here. You have a mutable P and you spawn you spawn a thread to say make P dot X equal to 42 and then print P. And then you have another thread which says make p.y42, right? Now, surprisingly, if you comment out this line, it works, right? You would imagine it works. It doesn't actually change the value, but it compiles. And you would imagine this is like seems incorrect, right? Uh, it's the same struct being changed by two different threads without any mutexes or whatever. So this actually caught me off guard when I was even writing this code for the presentation. So what is happening here is p.x is the variable that is actually moved. And because it's an int, 
to move from one thread over to another just by a clone. Like it is a copy by value. So when you're changing p.x, you're not really changing p.x, you're just changing some value that was passed into your thread or like the current value of p.x that was passed into your thread. But as soon as you do struct level access, so if you if you print p, what is happening is it's saying you have moved p into this thread, but you're also using p in this thread that is not allowed. Right. So the borrow checker kind of helps you and uh, like the Rust ecosystem calls it fearless concurrency. But yeah, I think it's only fearless if you don't fear like large 20, 50 line compiler errors. Right? Uh, there is also async await, which is kind of implemented slightly differently in Rust. Like only the async and await keywords are part of the language. And what they say is an async function is rewritten into a function that returns a future. And the await is like a poll call on the future to say, are you done, are you done? And the responsibility of actually scheduling such async functions and executing them in a like between a pool of threads is left to the runtimes. It is not part of the language. So you have a sync runtime implementations like Tokyo, or I think there's a sync standard. So they are only responsible for giving you the mechanism to create a set of threads and then run your async functions as futures on top of those threads, right? And also essentially do scheduling because they require scheduling. So yeah, I think. Uh, Concurrency is definitely very well handled, but it is still something that uh, I I have trouble wrapping my head around a lot of the times. So, what do I miss from closure? Uh, I think I definitely miss the ripple being able to connect to a live running program, interacting with it, uh, even changing it is amazing and. As soon as you move to a language that doesn't have it, you probably like you realize it has kind of become muscle memory and it like you have to learn new ways of dealing with that. Collections, as we discussed, they're not as ergonomic as collections in Rust are. Of course, the Rust ones are probably a lot more performant, but yeah. Dealing with collections and dealing with data processing uh, is is still a challenge in Rust. Uh, as I said, for shared state, I miss the ergonomics of something like atoms. Uh, I miss the ease of exploration, uh, which Closure provides. If you're writing exploratory code, you'll probably hear this from everyone in the community. Like Rust is not your choice if you're writing exploratory code, right? You are probably better off using something like Python or Clojure. Uh, macros, I, I, I have tended to move away from writing macros in Rust, but uh, there are places where you can write macros very safely and like being homo iconic, uh, fundamentally mac writing macros is, just like trying to process a data structure, just like trying to process a list. But in Rust, macros are not uh, that easy to write. They are, the language is not homo iconic, so you have to essentially you have to do token replacement, uh, which is kind of that doesn't give you the same joy. What I might miss once eventually I move away from Rust, if I do. Uh, I think the Rust compilers error messages are amazing. You should, like if you're trying to write Rust, you should definitely get into the habit of actually reading everything that the compiler tells you and uh, handling it instead of just saying, oh, fuck, there's, there's an error. Let, let's see if I can do something else. Right? The compiler is very smart at figuring out exactly what is going on. Uh, 
refactoring code is a breeze because it's all uh, compiled and type safe. You can easily uh, change around the shape of your data and the compiler will tell you where you've gone wrong instead of uh, relying on keys and searching for keywords throughout your code base. Right? Enums, of course, are a joy. I think uh, I would definitely miss enums, using enums or designing uh, code around use of enums and the pattern matching. And error handling, of course, uh, not having to deal with nils, uh, having proper result types, which tell you exactly what has gone wrong, forcing you to handle that. I think I'll definitely miss that when I move to closure. Yeah, so I think in conclusion, uh, I would say Rust and closure are quite complementary. I think this uh, this is also close to what uh, I think Joe had shared today morning uh, in the Reddit thread, right? So area where like areas where Rust doesn't do well happen to overlap a lot with areas where closure really does well. And areas where closure doesn't do very well are areas that are Rust strength. So yeah, I think uh, learning and having both of them in the toolkit has it will be a very good uh, uh, benefit for me. And yeah, I think I'm looking forward to going back to writing some closure code and seeing how it has affected the way I write closure. Yeah, I think that's it. We're done. Uh, let's stop my sharing. Yeah, uh, is there are there questions on the chat? No, no. Oh, yeah, all right. Do we have time for questions? I don't. Yeah, thanks. That was that was a such a great introduction, Rishi, and just really, uh, I think, useful to come at it from the perspective of like a background enclosure and and uh, you know a specifically crafted introduction for people with that background. So, yeah, thanks very much for that. We don't have time for questions, unfortunately, but um, you know, feel free to stick around. I I need to jump off, but. Um, uh, if people want, there's also a Rust channel in Slack and a Rust guild. So uh, by all means, like join the Slack channel um, or take there's you know, there's there's a thread in uh, some related discussion as well in the closure channel. So uh, thanks. Thanks again, all. And um, thanks. Thank you. Thanks again, Rishikesh, for putting together that um, those, you know, the whole presentation of slides in such a slick way. Very nice introduction. Um, uh yeah and uh see everyone again in two weeks time yeah thank you thank you for listening Cheers all. <laughs>